the paperback edition of The God Delusion is soon to come out in Britain in the middle of May, and in America it will come out in September or October. I've written a longish new preface to the paperback, which consists mostly of replies, responses to criticisms of the hardback. So what I thought I would do today is to uh, read out, do, give a little performance of reading the preface to the paperback, which nobody here has seen, uh, and then that'll take about the first half, and then the second half we'll have uh, a discussion, and I think we've got a roving mic, which, uh, is that right, we've we got a roving mic, which, no? no, no okay. So we, we, we don't have a roving mic, so people will have to just shout when it comes to asking questions or, or indeed making comments. Uh, I have brought here a Spanish edition of The God Delusion, uh, which I was, I, what I wanted to do was to bring a lot of copies of this, one for each of our wonderful naturalist guides. But unfortunately, books are extremely heavy and bulky and I couldn't get them into my suitcase. So what I will do is present this to the ship's library in the hope that uh, the naturalist guys and anybody else may like to, to read it there. Um, the, the, the British paperback, if anybody wants to see it, is, is here, and it's the preface to that that I'm now going to read and then invite questions. The God Delusion in the hardback edition was widely described as the surprise bestseller of 2006. It was warmly received by the great majority of those who sent in their personal reviews to Amazon, more than a thousand at the time of writing. Approval was less overwhelming in the printed reviews, however. A cynic might put this down to an unimaginative reflex of reviews editors. It has God in the title, so send it to a known faith head. That would be too cynical, however. Several unfavorable reviews began with the phrase which I long ago learned to treat as ominous, I'm an atheist, but. <laughs> as Dan Dennett noted in Breaking the Spell, a bafflingly large number of intellectuals believe in belief, even though they lack religious belief themselves. These vicarious second order believers are often more zealous than the real thing, their zeal pumped up by ingratiating broad-mindedness. Alas, I can't share your faith but I respect and sympathize with it. I'm an atheist, but the sequel is nearly always unhelpful, nihilistic, or worse, suffused with a sort of exultant negativity. Notice, by the way, the distinction from another favorite genre. I used to be an atheist, but that is one of the oldest tricks in the book, much favored by religious apologists from C.S. Lewis to the present day. It serves to establish some sort of street cred up front, and it is amazing how often it works. Look out for it. I wrote an article for the website richarddawkins.net called I'm an Atheist But, and I've borrowed from it in the following list of critical or otherwise negative points from reviews of the hardback. That website, conducted by the inspired Josh Timonen, has attracted an enormous number of contributors who have effectively eviscerated all these criticisms, but in less guarded, more outspoken tones than my own, or than those of my academic colleagues, A.C. Grayling, Daniel Dennett, Paul Kurtz, Stephen Weinberg, and others who have done so in print and reproduced on the same website. You can't criticize religion without a detailed analysis of learned books of theology. Surprise bestseller? If I'd gone to town as one self-consciously intellectual critic wished on the epistemological differences between Aquinas and Duns Scotus, if I'd done justice to Eriogena on subjectivity, Rana on grace, or Moltmann on hope, as he vainly hoped I would, my book would have been more than a surprise bestseller. It would have been a miraculous one. But that is not the point. Unlike Stephen Hawking, who accepted advice that every formula he published would halve his sales, I would happily have foregone bestsellerdom if there had been the slightest hope of Duns Scotus illuminating my central question of whether God exists. 
the vast majority of theological writings simply assume that he does and go on from there. For my purposes, I need consider only those theologians who take seriously the possibility that God does not exist and argue that he does. This, I think, chapter 3 does, with what I hope is good humour and sufficient comprehensiveness. When it comes to good humour, I cannot improve on the splendid Courtier's Reply, published by P.Z. Myers, that's P.Z. Myers to you, on his Feringula website. I have considered the impudent accusations of Mr. Dawkins with exasperation at his lack of serious scholarship. He has apparently not read the detailed discourses of Count Rodrigo of Seville on the exquisite and exotic leathers of the Emperor's boots. Nor does he give a moment's consideration to Bellini's masterwork on the luminescence of the Emperor's feathered hat. We have entire schools dedicated to writing learned treatises on the beauty of the Emperor's raiment and every major newspaper runs a section dedicated to imperial fashion. <laughs> Dawkins arrogantly ignores all these deep philosophical ponderings to crudely accuse the emperor of nudity. <laughs> until Dawkins has trained in the shops of Paris and Milan, until he has learned to tell the difference between a ruffled flounce and a puffy pantaloon, we should all pretend he has not spoken out against the emperor's taste. His training in biology may give him the ability to recognize dangling genitalia when he sees it, but it has not taught him the proper appreciation of imaginary fabrics. <laughs> to expand the point, most of us happily disavow fairies, astrology, and the flying spaghetti monster without first immersing ourselves in books of pastafarian theology, etc. The next criticism is a related one, the great straw man offensive. You always attack the worst of religion and ignore the best. You go after crude rabble-rousing chancers like Ted Haggard, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, rather than sophisticated theologians like Tillich or Bonhoeffer, who teach the sort of religion I believe in. If only such subtle, nuanced religion predominated, the world would surely be a better place, and I would have written a different book. The melancholy truth is that this kind of understated, decent religion is numerically negligible. To the vast majority of believers around the world, religion all too closely resembles what you hear from the likes of Robertson, Falwell or Haggard, Osama bin Laden, or the Ayatollah Khomeini. These are not straw men, they are all too influential, and everybody in the modern world has to deal with them. I'm an atheist, but I wish to dissociate myself from your shrill, strident, intemperate, intemperate, intolerant, ranting language. Actually, if you look at the language of the God delusion, it is rather less shrill or intemperate than we regularly take in our stride when listening to political commentators, for example, or theater, art, or book critics. Here are some samples of recent restaurant criticism from leading London newspapers. It is difficult, if not impossible, to imagine anyone conjuring up a restaurant, even in their sleep, where the food and its mediocrity comes so close to inedible. <laughs> All things considered, quite the worst restaurant in London, maybe the world, serves horrendous food grudgingly in a room that is a museum to Italian waiters' taste, Kirko 1976. The worst meal I've ever eaten. Not by a small margin, I mean the worst, the most unrelievedly awful. What looked like a sea mine in miniature was the most disgusting thing I put in my mouth since I ate earthworms at school. <laughs> the strongest language to be found in the God delusion is tame and measured by comparison. If it sounds intemperate, it is only because of the weird convention almost universally accepted, see the quotation from Douglas Adams in the book, that religious faith is uniquely privileged, above and beyond criticism. Insulting a restaurant might seem trivial compared to insulting God, but restaurateurs and chefs really exist, and they have feelings to be hurt. Whereas blasphemy, as the witty bumper sticker puts it, is a victimless crime. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
In 1915, the British Member of Parliament, Horatio Bottomley, recommended that after the war, if by chance you should discover one day in a restaurant you are being served by a German waiter, you will throw the soup in his foul face. If you find yourself sitting at the side of a German clerk, you will spill the ink pot over his foul head. Now that's strident and intolerant, and I should have thought ridiculous and ineffective as rhetoric, even in its own time. Contrast it with the opening sentence of chapter 2, which is the passage most often quoted as strident or shrill. It's not for me to say whether I succeeded, but my intention was closer to robust but humorous broadside than shrill polemic. In public readings of The God Delusion, this is the one passage that is guaranteed to get a good-natured laugh, which is why my wife and I invariably use it as the warm-up act to break the ice with a new audience. If I could venture to suggest why the humour works, I think it is the incongruous mismatch between a subject that could have been stridently or vulgarly expressed and the actual expression in a drawn-out list of Latinate or pseudo-scholarly words, filicidal, megalomaniacal, pestilential. My model here was one of the funniest writers of the 20th century, and nobody could call Evelyn Waugh shrill or strident. I even gave the game away by mentioning his name in the anecdote that immediately follows. Book critics or theatre critics can be derisively negative and gain delighted praise for the trenchant wit of their review. But in criticisms of religion, even clarity ceases to be a virtue and sounds like aggressive hostility. A politician may attack an opponent scathingly across the floor of the house and earn plaudits for his robust pugnacity. But let a soberly reasoning critic of religion employ what would in other contexts sound merely direct or forthright, and it will be described as a rant. Polite society will purse its lips and shake its head, even secular polite society, and especially that part of secular society that loves to announce, I'm an atheist, but... You're only preaching to the choir. What's the point? Convert's Corner on richarddawkins.net gives the lie to this premise, but even taking it at face value, there are good answers. One is that the non-believing choir is a lot bigger than many people think, especially in America. But again, especially in America, it is largely a closet choir, and it desperately needs encouragement to come out. Judging by the thanks I received all over North America on my book tour, the encouragement that people like Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, Christopher Hitchens and me are able to give is greatly appreciated. A more subtle reason for preaching to the choir is the need to raise consciousness. When the feminists raised our consciousness about sexist pronouns, they would have been preaching to the choir where the more substantive issues of the rights of women and the evils of discrimination against them were concerned. But that decent liberal choir still needed its consciousness raised with respect to everyday language. However right on we may have been on the political issues of rights and discrimination, we nevertheless still unconsciously bought into linguistic conventions that made half the human race feel excluded. There are other linguistic conventions that need to go the same way as sexist pronouns, and the atheist choir is not exempt. We all need our consciousness raised. Atheists, as well as theists, unconsciously observe society's convention that we must be especially polite and respectful to faith. And I never tire of drawing attention to society's tacit acceptance of the labelling of small children with the religious opinions of their parents. Atheists need to raise their own consciousness of the anomaly. Religious opinion is the one kind of parental opinion that, by almost universal consent, can be fastened upon children who are, in truth, too young to know what their opinion really is. There is no such thing as a Christian child, only a child of Christian parents. Seize every opportunity to ram it home. You are just as much of a fundamentalist as those you criticize. No, please, it is all too easy to mistake passion that can change its mind for fundamentalism, which never will. Fundamentalist Christians are passionately opposed to evolution, and I am passionately in favor of it. Passion for passion, we are evenly matched, and that, according to some, means we are equally fundamentalist. But 
to borrow an aphorism whose source I'm unable to pin down, when two opposite points of view are expressed with equal force, the truth does not necessarily lie midway between them. It is possible for one side to be simply wrong, and that justifies passion on the other side. Fundamentalists know what they believe, and they know that nothing will change their minds. The quotation from Kurt Wise in the book says it all. If, the evidence, if all the evidence in the universe turns against creationism, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a creationist because that is what the word of God seems to indicate. Here I must stand. It is impossible to overstress the difference between such a passionate commitment to biblical fundamentals and the true scientist's equally passionate commitment to evidence. The fundamentalist Kurt Wise proclaims that all the evidence in the universe would not change his mind. The true scientist, however passionately he may believe in evolution, knows exactly what it would take to change his mind. Evidence. As J.B.S. Haldane said when asked what evidence might contradict evolution, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. Let me coin my own opposite version of Kurt Wise's manifesto. If all the evidence in the universe turns in favour of creationism, I would be the first to admit it, and I would immediately change my mind. As things stand, however, all available evidence, and there is a vast amount of it, favours evolution. It is for this reason and this reason alone that I argue for evolution, with a passion that matches the passion of those who argue against it. My passion is based on evidence. Theirs, flying in the face of evidence as it does, is truly fundamentalist. I'm an atheist myself, but religion is here to stay. Live with it. You want to get rid of religion? Good luck to you. You think you can get rid of religion? What planet are you living on? Religion is a fixture. Get over it. I could bear any of these downers if they were uttered in something approaching a tone of regret or concern. On the contrary, the tone of voice is sometimes downright gleeful. I don't think it's masochism. More probably, we can put it down to belief in belief again. These people may not be religious themselves, but they love the idea that other people are religious. This brings me to my final category of naysayers. I'm an atheist myself, but people need religion. What are you going to put in its place? How are you going to comfort the bereaved? How are you going to fill the need? What patronizing condescension. You and I, of course, are much too intelligent and well-educated to need religion. But ordinary people, hoi polloi, the Orwellian proles, the Huxleyan deltas and Ipsilon semi-morons, need religion. I'm reminded of an occasion when I was lecturing at a conference on the public understanding of science, and I briefly inveighed against dumbing down. In the question and answer session at the end, one member of the audience stood up and suggested that dumbing down might be necessary to bring minorities and women to science. His tone of voice told that he genuinely thought he was being liberal and progressive. I can just imagine what the women and minorities in the audience thought about it. Returning to humanity's need for comfort, it is of course real, but isn't there something childish in the belief that the universe owes us comfort as of right? Isaac Asimov's remark about the infantilism of pseudoscience is just as applicable to religion. Inspect every piece of pseudoscience and you will find a security blanket, a thumb to suck, a skirt to hold. It is astonishing, moreover, how many people are unable to understand that X is comforting does not imply X is true. A related plaint concerns the need for a purpose in life. To quote one Canadian critic, the atheist may be right about God, who knows, but God or no God, it's clear that something in the human soul requires a belief that life has a purpose that transcends the material plane. One would think that a more rational than thou empiricist such as Dawkins would recognize this unchanging aspect of human nature. Does Dawkins really think this world would be a more humane place if we all look to the God delusion instead of the Bible for truth and comfort? 
actually, yes. <laughs> Since you mention humane, yes, I do. But I must repeat yet again that the consolation content of a belief does not raise its truth value. Of course, I cannot deny the need for emotional comfort, and I cannot claim that the worldview adopted in this book offers any more than moderate comfort to, for example, the bereaved. But if the comfort that religion seems to offer is founded on the neurologically highly implausible premise that we survive the death of our brains, do you really want to defend it? In any case, I don't think I've ever met anyone at a funeral who dissents from the view that the non-religious part, eulogies, the deceased's favorite poems or music, are more moving than the prayers. Having read The God Delusion, Dr. David Ashton, a British consultant physician, wrote to me on the unexpected death on Christmas Day 2006 of his beloved 17-year-old son, Luke. Shortly before Luke's death, the two of them had talked appreciatively of the charitable foundation that I'm setting up to encourage reason and science. At Luke's funeral on the Isle of Man, his father suggested to the congregation that if they wished to make any kind of contribution in Luke's memory, they should send it to my foundation, as Luke would have wished. The 30 cheques received amounted to more than £2,000, including more than £600 from a whip round in the local village pub. This boy was obviously much loved. When I read the order of service for the funeral ceremony, I literally wept, although I had never met Luke, and I asked for permission to reproduce it at richarddawkins.net. A lone piper played the Manx Lament, Ellen Vallin. Two friends spoke eulogies. Dr. Ashton himself recited Dylan Thomas's beautiful poem, Fern Hill. Now as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, so achingly evocative of lost youth. And then I catch my breath to report he read the opening lines of my own Unweaving the Rainbow, lines that I have long earmarked for my own funeral. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. Obviously, there are exceptions, but I suspect that for many people, the main reason they cling to religion is not that it is consoling, but that they've been let down by our educational system and don't realize that non-belief is even an option. This is certainly true of most people who think they are creationists. They've simply not been properly taught Darwin's astounding alternative. Probably the same is true of the belittling myth that people need religion. At a recent conference in 2006, an anthropologist and prize specimen of I'm an atheist buttery quoted Golda Meir when asked whether she believed in God. I believe in the Jewish people and the Jewish people believe in God. Our anthropologist substituted his own version. I believe in people, and people believe in God. I prefer to say that I believe in people, and people, when given the right encouragement to think for themselves about all the information now available, very often turn out not to believe in God, and to lead fulfilled and satisfied, indeed liberated, lives. whip round at the local pub? Uh, the question is about the phrase whip round at a local pub. This must be one of those places where we are, what is it, um, divided by a common language. Uh, um, a whip round, you pass a hat round the pub, the inn, 
the beer house, <laughs> and everybody put something in the in the hat. Uh, this boy, Luke Ashton, six hundred pounds—that's twelve hundred dollars—were raised by passing a hat round the pub. Whip, whip, W H I P. Yes. Question, Dr. Dawkins. Yes. Uh, Stephen Weinberg wrote a critique on Times Online, five pages that was very favorable, but did comment that you, you didn't really take to task in your book, The God Delusion, the fundamentalist Islamics uh, are creating all kinds of problems around the world as much as you did American fundamentalists. Would you care to comment yeah. about his comment? I was brought up uh, Christian. Uh, I'm a cultural Anglican and Christianity is what I know best. So naturally I concentrated most on what I know best. Uh, it is certainly true that Islam in the world is probably the major evil. And uh, it would be very desirable to write a book which uh, spends more time uh, criticizing Islam. Um, fortunately, very shortly after mine came out, Christopher Hitchens brought out God is Not Great, which is a marvelous book. Uh, and which really does um, do justice to Islam. I strongly recommend God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. You often have two general sort of attacks on your book, on your books or on your writings in general. Um, I put them in two categories. One, ad hominem, which, you know, is, is easily dismissible if you have your, your eloquence and your stamina. Um, the other one is the, the sort of Mel Connor approach, and you mentioned it a little bit, the why bother? And, you know, that's also sort of, you know, I, I chalk it up to intellectual laziness or intellectual dishonesty. If you had a challenging, an actual challenging or reasonable um, response to your book, which one um, would you consider more, the most challenging for you to um, reply to, besides ad hominems or the intellectual laziness or intellectual dishonesty? Or okay, so you're dismissing both those. You're dismissing both the ad hominem and the why bother approach, and you're asking me what would be the, the, the best criticism I could imagine. Well, I think you do a good enough job of dealing with the ad hominems and, de and dealing with the, the intellectual laziness. I'm just asking whether, whether I've understood you correctly. Okay, fine. Um, so what would be the best criticism? I think the, the best criticism was, would be any kind of uh, suggestion that there really is good evidence that some kind of supernatural being exists. and. I don't believe there is a single review of The God Delusion or either of Sam Harris's two books or uh, Christopher Hitchens's book. Not one of them has actually suggested that there is any evidence whatsoever for any kind of supernatural being at all. So they're nearly, all, nearly all the criticisms are either ad hominem or why bother or why don't you read more theology. Not a single one of them uh, actually produces any kind of positive case for the existence of any kind of God. But that would be a good, a good criticism if anybody could come up with one. I think it's revealing that nobody has. I don't believe anybody could. I was wondering if you could comment some on sort of the, the process of creating public opinion that's, that's going on in this country around atheism. To me, it's pretty unprecedented to see the cover of Wired magazine <coughs> or articles in Newsweek on uh, atheism, and uh, it seems that uh, the books are obviously an impetus for this, but I'm wondering uh, what other processes are, are at work here. I saw a speech you gave at uh, TED in 2002, um, and this is a gathering of uh, a thousand elite uh, businessmen and artists and technology people in Monterey every year. And you called upon them to add probable non-believers to step forward and finance and help this. I'm wondering if that, if that has happened at all and uh, sort of what's, what's going on here. When you say this country, you of course mean United States of America, not Ecuador or <laughs> Galapagos. Um, well, I'm not much of a reader of the zeitgeist. I'm kind of conscious that a lot, lot of people who are discern that there is a rising movement of um, opposition to religion in the United States uh, and I think we all sense it and I think we're all part of it uh, and 
um, other people here may have a better idea than I have as to what's caused it. I should like to think that books such as uh, Sam Harris's The End of Faith, Land Letter to a Christian Nation, my own The God Delusion, uh, Christopher Hitchens's uh, God is Not Great, um, Victor Stenger's uh, Help Me Somebody, um, God the Failed Hypothesis. I think that all these books are probably having some effect. I wonder whether another part of it is that uh, Americans are fed up after seven, six years of Bush with the drift, what appears to be to many people, to be a drift towards a theocracy. And it may be that a lot of people who never were religious in the first place, but felt tolerant, and as we all should be tolerant when, when it's necessary, uh, and peaceful, and if people want to believe that, why shouldn't they believe it? I think maybe people in America have realized that the religious right in America is no longer playing by the rules, is no longer letting uh, live and have, uh, is no longer adopting a live and let live policy. And so it's possible that it's a climate of rebellion against that. And I don't know, that's, that's, one, that's one possibility. But others, I mean, I'm not American, and so I'm probably much less qualified to say than most people here. Could you talk a little bit about the absolute loathing of atheists in the political uh, spectrum that almost anybody could be elected sooner than an atheist. You shouldn't, you certainly couldn't announce it publicly. George Bush the first said that atheists don't deserve to be citizens of this country. Um, now there's a debate on which is worse, a Mormon or an atheist. Uh, well. <laughs> Yes. It, it is an astonishing thing that people are prepared to say they'll, they'll, they'll vote for somebody who believes in anything at all. Right. Presumably they'll vote for somebody who believes in, in Wotan, uh, Baal, uh, rather, than, rather than an atheist. Um, one congressman, and somebody's going to help me with his name because he deserves full credit. Peter Stark, with a K, is it? Yes, Peter Stark, Congressman Peter Stark, um, came out having been invited to do so, I think by this organization? Is that right or not? Yes, Secular Co Coalition. Um, and he deserves great credit, and the heavens didn't open, the earth didn't open and swallow him up. Uh, he'll probably get re-elected. Um, so um, maybe that's an example to everyone. I don't think I understand it. It's perfectly true that the word atheist in American cultural life has uh, ranks approximately along with pedophile uh, as somebody you couldn't possibly vote for. It is totally bizarre when you think that, the, that all an atheist is is somebody who has a different philosophical opinion about the cosmos um, than, than you do. And the people that you're prepared to vote for, the ones who believe in anything, uh, they believe in such a diverse variety of things that in any case, how can you possibly say you'll vote for any of them but not one who doesn't believe in any of them? Um, you suggested that uh, Mormons are... Um, uh, the the, the toss-up is whether... Yes. Um, I mean, the, the Mormon religion is so obviously fake, founded by a transparent charlatan in the 19th century, Joseph Smith, I mean, nothing could be more obvious than that that man was a fake and a charlatan and a liar. And yet now we have a presidential candidate who is prepared to say that he believes in this mountebank, who wrote a bogus book, the Book of Mormon, although he was writing in the 19th century, chose to write it in 17th century English. I mean, why don't people see through that? I just can't understand it. Um, but anyway, um, that was a digression rate. <laughs> I, I wanted to see if I understood you correctly to say that um, uh, most Americans who do have faith are extremists. Uh, maybe I misunderstood. No, not at all. Um, I, I didn't mean to say that most Americans who have faith are extremists. 
Um, what I do think is that those who are not extremists, the moderates, the, the bishops, the, um, uh, the decent, intelligent Christians that you can have a conversation with, they are making the world safe for the extremists because they are teaching us all that we have to respect faith without evidence. And if once you teach children and they grow up believing that you have to respect faith without evidence, then, uh, then the world is made safe for the extremists who are going to cash in on that and say, oh, you can't criticize my desire to do something extreme, maybe even b blow somebody up, uh, because that's my faith, and my faith is immune from all criticism. It seems to me to be educationally an, a dismal, abysmal thing to do, to teach children that faith is a virtue, to teach children that it is a virtue to believe something for no reason at all, for, where there's no evidence, just because you believe it, because you believe it, because you believe it. And if children are brought up thinking that that's the right way to assemble the beliefs that they hold about the world, then extremists have a field day, because they can cash in on that. Hi, so I agree with your uh, argument that um, it, the preaching to the choir is actually a really good thing, even if you don't necessarily preach to the, everyone else. Um, in the Beyond the Leap lecture, you were talking to Joan Ruffgarden about um, the fact that sometimes it's, it makes sense to talk to people using a certain cognitive framework that they understand. And while I don't think it's good to dumb down things, do you think that it would be a good idea for someone such as yourself to write a book about religion in a cognitive framework accessible to those people, and what would such a book look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a good point that, that, there are, that both approaches are valuable. And I suppose Dan Dennett's book, Breaking the Spell, which I should have mentioned already, by the way, another very important book, which might well have contributed to shifting the zeitgeist. Dan Dennett's Breaking the Spell does take a more softly, softly approach and tries to woo religious people, tries to make them feel it's actually, it's not as bad as you think. Um, let's, let's look at this question of, of religion. Let's examine it. Let's see where it comes from. Um, we don't bite. We don't eat babies and so on. I, I think there is a lot of value in that. It's not my way, uh, and that's not what I've done, but it is what Dan Dennett's done, and uh, I strongly recommend his book, Breaking the Spell. Richard, uh, I, I wouldn't ever want to argue with you. Um, you have uh, your British education and your British accent, and uh, uh, but you seem kinder than, uh, say, Christopher Hitchens, who I would never argue with. <laughs> well. Let's not, um, let's not deal in national stereotypes here. Um, uh, the British can be kind, and the British can be, um, can be aggressive as well. Um, well, my I, comment to you is that um, I, I don't believe in a god or a superior being. I think that, like Marx, I believe that religion is the um, chains of the, of the masses. Um, and much evil has been done in the name of religion. At the same time, and this is not something that can be argued, I believe, because um, I don't care to argue it. My experience of the universe is that it is streaming with light and intelligence and uh, energy, and on a personal level, I feel that as spirit and this is from my own personal experience. So it's not something that I would attempt to convince you of or attempt to uh, submit to your examination. I think we're playing with words here. I think we probably agree that we might not use quite the same words. The universe is streaming with life, intelligence, Yes, and science is trying to understand how it comes into being, and very, very difficult it is. It's a very profoundly difficult problem. It's a problem that our science has made great strides in understanding and uh, will continue to do so. Spirit, you use the word spirit. Well, you can use the word spirit to apply to the sort of not mystical, but the sort of exultant feeling of wonder that Einstein felt when contemplating the universe. Einstein even went so far as to use the word God, although he was adamant that he didn't believe in God as a personal being. So, um, in the first chapter of The God Delusion, I talk about Einsteinian religion as something that I can subscribe to, and, I, and Carl Sagan would subscribe to, and I think 
many scientists would. Uh, but it isn't supernatural. I suspect actually that future science, when it gets to grips with all that there is to know about the cosmos, about the origin of the universe, about uh, multidimensional space, reality will turn out to be far more wonderful than any theologian has ever dreamed. And uh, if you want to use the word spiritual for that, then I'm with you except for the use of the word. So I don't think we disagree. Uh, but I think that if you use a word like spiritual, you lay yourself open to misunderstanding. And make no mistake, people are very eager to misunderstand. And they will think you're talking about a supernatural God. They may even think you're talking about Jesus or Allah or whatever particular God they happen to have been brought up with. So my advice would be don't use a word like spiritual, but, but use the same sentiment in some other way. Can you comment on the recent scientific investigations uh, into the God gene uh, and uh, possibly related to uh, Freud's future of illusion? He, he seemed to have a, a very unscientific explanation that seemed to fit very well. When you talk about the God gene, when you talk about the anything gene, you've got to be very careful what you're talking about because it's all too easy to misunderstand it as meaning that if you've got this gene, then inevitably you have the characteristic concern. So if you've got such and such a gene, then you will be religious, and if you haven't, you won't. There are some genes that work like that in that deterministic way, a Calvinistically deterministic way, but most of them don't. Most of them contribute statistically to the likelihood that you will show some kind of characteristic, such as religiosity. The, the way that uh, you can investigate this is twin studies, comparing monozygotic, identical twins with fraternal twins who are just like ordinary brothers or sisters. Uh, and ideally what you do is you, you exploit the existence of pairs of twins who happen to be brought up separately. And there aren't that many of them, a few dozen, but those that, that exist have been mostly tracked down and, and looked at. And by comparing the resemblance between pairs of twins who are monozygotic and dizygotic, reared together and reared apart, all four categories, you can work out how, uh, um, how strong is the hereditary determination of the characteristic concern, whether it's height or weight or um, musical ability, mathematical ability, or religiosity. Now, it has been suggested that religiosity does have a very high heritability. That's to say, um, uh, if you have such and such a gene, you have a very high statistical probability of being, of being religious. Um, it doesn't seem to me to bear it on the, the truth value of religious claims one way or the other. I think we have to decide those separately, and uh, I think we, we can do that separately. I think it's scientifically interesting to know uh, how heritable religiosity is, uh, but it doesn't bear upon the truth value. Dr. Dawkins, um, it's one thing in your book that uh, that I was puzzled about, and that is the use of uh, the term child abuse to describe what you were talking about just a few minutes ago. Um, I, I was brought up in uh, the Lutheran tradition and taught uh, you know, Luther's catechism and so forth, uh, most of which I now consider to be nonsense, maybe all of it nonsense. Um, you, you, were brought up in the Anglican tradition, and I don't have not seen anything in your writings to indicate that you feel like you were abused as a child. In fact, in uh, Unweaving the Rainbow, you seem to <coughs> express some sentimental uh, appreciation for that upbringing. Um, while I agree that that it's regrettable uh, that that sort of thing occurs, uh, parents teaching their children that which they most highly value, which for many people is religion, could hardly be considered child abuse in, in any any normal sense of the term. Could you right. explain why you yeah. uh, chose um, that metaphor? I use child abuse most, most strongly, I think, when talking about teaching children about hell. Because that, I think, is psychological child abuse. I find it would be quite hard to, uh, to dissent from that. I, I, think if, I hope I haven't used the word child abuse for all religious education. I don't think I have. 
I've, I think a, a slightly milder form of child abuse is the labeling of children, the tying around the neck of a child of a label that says you are a Lutheran child or you are a, an Anglican child or you are a Catholic child or a Muslim child. Um, that I think is child abuse in that it categorizes the child for the whole of its life very often with opinions which the child is too young to know about. But I agree with you that that's not as bad as telling a child about hell, which I think really is uh, proper child abuse, very likely as bad as physical child abuse, sexual child abuse, which uh, Roman Catholic priests, for example, are so often accused of. Um, I tell the story in the book of how I, uh, in, in Dublin, talking to a Dublin audience, I was asked about the um, uh, then highly publicized cases of Irish and American Roman Catholic priests sexually abusing children. And I said that I thought that in many cases uh, that was less harmful than some of the doctrines of bringing, in bringing up the children as Catholic in the first place. And I got a, a cheer from this Dublin audience. And again, I suspect the reason was that Ireland too has been um, in the grip of, in this case, a Roman Catholic uh, theocracy for a long time. is coming out of it now. And I think that this cheer that I got was, was responding to that. Maybe it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that, uh, that tying a label around a child's neck as Catholic or Muslim, whatever it is, is child abuse. Um, but sometimes it does no harm to exaggerate just a little bit in the interest of consciousness raising. Let me retract from that then and say what I want to say, which is that uh, just as we've all been taught by feminists to flinch when we hear the phrase one man, one vote, we should also all flinch when we hear the phrase Catholic child, Christian child, Muslim child, Protestant child. There is no such thing as a Catholic child, etc. So if you don't like child abuse, then forget child abuse for that, but do please uh, have your consciousness raised so that you flinch when you hear the phrase Catholic child, etc. As an atheist parent, would it be child abuse in a way raising your child as I am an atheist I in a highly Christian society? Well, what, I tell you what I think is the best thing to do is to, is to raise your children in the knowledge that, that, exi that religion exists and is a real phenomenon in the world but I think, it, I think they should be taught that there are lots of different religions and the children will work out for themselves that if there are lots of different religions, they can't all be right. Uh, but I think what would be just as bad as telling a child, you are a Catholic child, would be to tell a child, you are an atheist child. Um, that's something for the child itself, himself or herself, to decide. Uh, and uh, I think it's just the same kind of labeling. Children are children who are too young to know their philosophical opinion should no more be called an atheist or a Christian child than you would call them a Marxist child or a monetarist child. Uh, you know, your, your, your kind of book has helped empowered me as an educator uh, to, to, and I think all of us should, is be not so afraid to speak out. In America, I don't know what they say in England, when people sneeze here, they always say, bless you or God bless you. And I usually use that as an introduction to say it won't help viruses are atheists and so am I and then very often that will start a conversation in which people will inevitably kind of quickly say but you must believe in something Dr. Marx and then I say yes I do the truth and um, that's kind of helpful you can use yeah. that I, 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 it works for me I don't know what they say in England yes. when you sneeze yes um, I mean, I, that, that seems to me to be a perfectly good example of consciousness raising. Uh, I think it would be pompous to object to anybody saying bless you when, when they sneeze, uh, but um, just to draw attention to it and, start, and use it to start a conversation uh, seems to me to be a, a very good example of consciousness raising. You reference Einstein and Sagan. Both Where are, are you, please? Where yeah, are I'm right here. Right. Both of who said they believed in the god of Spinoza. Uh, can you go that far? Well, I know that's a topic. I, I, th I think I can because my understanding of the God of Spinoza is that he doesn't do anything and actually doesn't really exist. Um, 
So, uh, and I don't think Einstein thought that there was any intelligence that existed, any intelligent entity that existed. So, uh, I'm pretty sure that I agree with, with what Einstein said, so I'd better. Um, uh, um, but I, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether it, whether it was whether Einstein was right to say that he that he was that he believed in Spinoza's God because I ne never quite understood whether Spinoza's God was really there or not. Somewhat related to an earlier question, you made the statement that if all the evidence supported creationism, it would immediately accept creationism. Would you like to speculate strictly in imagination as to what evidence there might be? Uh, it would be very difficult to um, uh, to imagine evidence that would support creationism. I suppose. Uh, well, I suppose one thing is that is that God could reveal Himself and uh, and actually tell us. What would He reveal? Um, well, I mean, uh, once He'd established His credentials. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I think it wouldn't be beyond the wish of God to find a way to establish his, his credentials if he existed. Um, I suppose that um, a genuine example of uh, a fossil no, well, even a fossil right out of place, like Haldane's fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. Uh, well, if, if, if such a thing were found, I would first of all say it's a hoax, and then if it somehow it could be uh, proved that it wasn't a hoax, there really, really were r rabbits living in the Precambrian, then I would start thinking in terms of uh, an alternative evolution from another planet or something landing in... I'd start talking about panspermia, um, it will be very, very, very hard, as, the, as you imply in your question, to actually think of what possible evidence there could be. Um, I, well, I mean, it, it, it will certainly be a great help to that case if the creationists could do what they're always trying to do, which is to, to discredit the evidence for evolution. So, for example, if you look at the distribution of DNA codes around the animal and plant kingdoms, which at present follow a perfect hierarchy, um, increasingly wide bracketing of cousinship, it all fits. If you do it for one molecule, you get one tree. If you do it for another molecule, you get the same tree. Another molecule, you get the same tree. I suppose if every molecule gave you a different tree, um, that would be... Well, I mean, could still come up with a different model of evolution that that, that explained it. Um, if the di if the geographic distribution of animals, such as we see here on the Galapagos, was exactly wrong, if if instead of showing the pattern that it does, which is that um, the animals here are clearly derived from the South American mainland, but they've had time to to change, and on different islands they've had time to change again. Um, and the more remote islands have slightly more distant um, things. If, it, if everything like that went wrong, uh, and if, if say, small islands, say, say if, if the Galapagos fauna was exactly the same as the Hawaiian fauna, um, but different from, um, from any mainland or something, I guess if you piled up masses and masses of evidence, you'd conclude that evolution probably isn't true. But even that wouldn't say that God did it. Um, you'd, it would still be a, a huge leap from that to say that God did it, because um, as many people have argued, including me, you're still left with a massive stumbling block of explaining where where God came from. Uh, I really enjoyed an interview I saw you do where you pointed out to an interviewer that he also was an atheist where Zeus and Poseidon and those guys were concerned. Um, and it was simply a matter of which ones you decided to accept and which ones you decided to reject and those ones you would also be an atheist for. Um, we all giggle nowadays when you suggest uh, Zeus and Poseidon and, and Aphrodite. Do you envision a time when the Judeo-Christian construct might be just as obsolete and something else would take its place? God willing, yes. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, um, uh, Sam Harris is also very fond of using uh, Poseidon as an example, and he, and he said that nobody nowadays believes in Poseidon. 
um, he then got several irate letters from yes. devout <laughs> Poseidon worshippers, yes. <laughs> Now, referring to the question about the God gene, it's impossible for me to see that there is such a thing as an actual God gene, but I believe that the human genome itself is responsible for God in the sense that when our species developed to the point where we had sufficient intelligence to ask the question about how we got to be here and how this came about, we didn't have the knowledge to give a meaningful answer. We had to make it up at that stage. And I think the inevitable result was religion and a concept of God. And to me, all that can be summarized in a very brief mathematical equation, which simply says intelligence times ignorance equals God. Do you believe that religion was inevitable in the course of the evolution of our species? I think inevitable is a strong word to use. Uh, religion certainly has arisen independently, or, or maybe not independently, but in all cultures that we know of. And so, in that case, you might say it's inevitable in the same sense as, say, heterosexual lust was. Uh, we don't all have it, but, but, um, we, but we know what it is, and we all come from a culture which, which has it. Um, so I wouldn't want to use the word inevitable, I, although it's very easy to say, and I say it, that uh, before we had scientific knowledge, there was no other recourse to the human questioning than to say there must be a god. Um, yet when you actually think that argument through, it's a thoroughly bad argument. Um, you, you, I mean, the, the, the way to put this would be to say, as I did at the beginning of The Selfish Gene, I think, uh, before Darwin, everybody had to be an atheist um, and, and in, I think in a sense that's that's right but yet even without Darwin even without a perfectly good explanation as Darwin's given us for why we all exist the, the explanation that says God did it is is a terrible explanation it doesn't work it's a, it's it's incoherent and therefore even without Darwin um, a really intelligent person should not have been a theist Darwin made it a hell of a lot easier to be an atheist, but I, I think, logically speaking, we didn't actually need Darwin in order to be atheist, but most of us are fallible, and the pre-Darwinian atheist, such as Hume, would have had, uh, he'd have been co confident in, in his logical rightness, but he must have worried about wh where all this organization and elegance and beauty came from. He would have been hugely relieved had he lived long enough to read The Origin of Species.